If there's a word which I suppose would dominate my thinking, it is humanism. And there's a link to Italy, of course, the whole humanistic philosophy and the Renaissance. I was born in Florence. As it happens, I was born more or less overlooking Brunelleschi's wonderful dome. I was strongly influenced by my mother, who was a potter. Coming from Italy, with very modern views, she sheltered me from fear of the new, the shock of the new. I was greatly influenced by her view, and my father's too, of art as being part of life. Of all the greatest things that I enjoy, it's culture, and aesthetic is a primary part of culture. Humanizing is a critical element about planning and architecture and creating buildings that encourage, and spaces that encourage, that humanism. I believe strongly in ethics, fairness, ethos. Public space is the physical manifestation of human values. Individuals have rights to public space. I was very much involved with my teens in political and social environment. And of course, campaigning is a critical part of this. I've always been more interested in periods of change. Therefore, I prefer early Renaissance, early Gothic, and early modern, in a way, to over-rich architecture of the later periods. I'm searching for an aesthetic which allows for change. The ability of buildings to respond like a sunflower opening to the, to the sun. Buildings have to open and absorb the sun, or buildings have to adapt. I have a very beautiful watch from my mother. It's very much inside out because it wears its machine on the outside. It's a very beautiful watch in terms of it's all colors, and I love color. You see the workings of it. So in a way, it encapsulates what I do. We as architects are both scientists and artists. You express the process of construction, the way you put a building together. Materials are, are a very key part of, of the aesthetic of a building. It's the humanization of the parts, so that they are legible, just like my watch. All those little bits in the watch give scale. Scale is key to architecture. It's your hand, and your hand is really the imprint that you put on everything. Think out of scale means that there is no relationship to the human body, to your hand. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to today's show. Today, a very special review indeed. A long time overdue, and you wouldn't have seen the unboxing because like an idiot, I unboxed it by accident. I was expecting a different watch I'd ordered for a friend, uh, so I didn't get to do the unboxing, but uh, yes, I have bought a Space Viewer, and that is my wristwatch check. I'm wearing two watches. I'm wearing the, uh, the Tudor Submariner, the pinky, the old pinky there, and the Bulova, this is the Space View, this is the uh, 214 uh, movement uh, Space View, which we'll get into in just a second. But before we do that, a little bit of background on Bulova. Now, Bulova were founded in New York City, uh, actually not, so, not too far away from where I'm sitting right now at this present moment. And they were founded in 1877. Uh, so a true American company. Now, of course, they're owned by Citizen. I think they got bought in about 2007. This watch I've lusted after for many, many years, and it's special for a whole load of reasons, uh, which we'll get into in just a moment. Bulova really have a very rich, incredible history, and the Accutron is uh, very important for many different reasons. It was born into an age of discovery of of American greatness. You know, uh, got the moon missions of the 60s, and actually the Accutron technology was utilized in I think over 40 NASA space missions. It was even uh, used on the clocks on Air Force One. It was that much of an impact on American mainstream culture. Now, of course, Bulova have had their ups and downs. They've had, a, I think, it, in the last couple of years, we've seen the precisionist movements, which are incredibly accurate, plus minus 10 seconds a year, which is phenomenal. But uh, way before Quartz, there was, of course, uh, the tuning fork technology, which we're gonna have a look at today. And there's an incredible story, legend has it, that the release of the tuning fork technology in Accutron watches was actually delayed by the American government because uh, they were using this technology in uh, spy satellites during the Cold War, uh, which is just phenomenal. So, um, what, what an incredible story, real part of American 
uh, history, really is. Anyway, before I rabbit on far too much about Bulova, let's change perspectives and have a closer look at my stunning latest acquisition and probably the coolest watch ever made, certainly for under $500. Today I am reviewing the Bolova Accutron Space View. This is the 214. And of course, this is a tuning fork watch. Uh, something of an icon. In fact, a bit of a forgotten about icon. And I was uh, greatly inspired actually by my good friend Mark. He did a video about comparing uh, automatic to um, uh, quartz movements. And in that video, he shared his little Bulova Accutron. I kind of forgot about this watch, and at the same time, I was, I've, I've always, uh, always lusted after one because of my one of my biggest heroes in life is the British Italian architect Richard Rogers. Hopefully, you would have seen on the intro. Uh, it's his watch of choice. He's famous for. He's a bit of a style icon, and certainly um, very well respected for his uh, his architectural legacy. I mean, he's one of the greatest architects of the 20th century, uh, without a doubt. He always wears either Swatch watches or his beloved uh, Bulova Accutron. So a few weeks ago, I managed to track down a seller um, in Georgia in the USA who restores um, Accutron uh, watches, especially the Space View, and sells them on eBay. So I was very, very lucky to come across this particular piece today. So what is the Accutron and why is it so important to the history of uh, wristwatches. Well, let's say good look at this one. So as you can see, it has this very unique look to it. And when you see it, it totally makes sense why Richard Rogers uh, would love this watch. As you guys know, if you're familiar with his work, uh, Richard Rogers built the, uh, probably his famous, most famous building is the Pompidou uh, Centre in Paris. And probably second to that is the Lloyds building in London. And they both share a very similar aesthetic. Now, at first glance, they look quite ugly, industrial, but what made them so special and way ahead of their time was that the insides were on the outside. So um, it completely revolutionized architecture and it was a new way of thinking and a new way of, uh, of building, really. It made Richard Rogers a star, you know, it, 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 it immortalized him in architectural history. And this watch kind of echoes that, uh, that ideology, that, that aesthetic. Very much so. So you can see the attraction, and it is a, an iconic watch in its own right. This really is a precursor to quartz. This came out in 1960. As you guys know, quartz watches were invented in 1969 and became hugely popular in the 70s and then obviously into the 80s. Uh, but this kind of predates that. This is a, a, the kind of missing link. It's um, partly mechanical and uh, partly electronic. So how is it powered? Well, on the back, we have a battery. And uh, then we have these two coiled magnets and a tuning fork running around. Actually, let me get my pencil. The tuning fork, which goes from here all the way down to the bottom. And this operates at 360 hertz. Just astounding. Now, what is amazing is the production techniques that went into this. I mean, the wire on these little... Um, on these little coils is, is super thin it really is a beautifully made thing and something that that uh, doesn't you know is, is not easy to do um, so it is not only is it beautifully made but it uh, it operates in in such a unique way and this of course is pr uh, before integrated circuits were de developed so uh, these you can see the soldering now the indices to tell the time are actually printed on the uh, plastic crystal here uh, this of course is way before sapphire and then we have stainless steel case with quite kind of traditional um, lugs. If we bring in a Timex of the same, a mechanical Timex of the same era, the case is very, very similar. But the, the actual uh, movement and the dial is just dramatically different. And this would have been quite space age. I mean, hence the name, obviously. I mean, it, it makes me think of the Forbidden Planet and just classic science fiction films. It has that magic, it has that charm to it. And that smooth sweep because of that 360 hertz tuning fork just makes it, it's so smooth. I mean, if we were to slow it down, it would still run like butter, it really would. Now the, the leather band it comes with, it's just a cheap old leather band. I'm gonna replace this as soon as I can. I'm gonna put it on a really nice, um, maybe something a little bit futuristic to kind of echo its aesthetic. And I love the, the, the mix of colors, you know, the wiring inside. We have little yellow wires and then the tone of the, um, 
the metal uh, base plate at the back and then the almost like a toy that that, that luscious green of the uh, the plastic uh, where all the little bits and bobs and transistors and all the rest of it are attached it's just phenomenal and what is really interesting is the hands the hands are kind of like sword hands almost juxtapose the modernist um look of the, the of the movement we have these very kind of traditional hands it's gorgeous i mean it really is uh bursting with 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 personality and character and of course we have the bulova logo at the top of the 12 o'clock with accutron proudly displayed there very minimal um and i love the way if when it distorts it, it's just a marvel to look at i've been wearing this uh, on and off for a few days and when I check the time I get carried away I just forget to check the time I just get mesmerized by this beautiful looking movement and the great thing is these are really not that expensive this is an iconic watch I paid about three hundred dollars you can get these from about three to four hundred dollars restored this is obviously um, new old stock parts put together lovingly and very very well put together by um, a seller he's called KY Watches 23 as 100%. I'll leave a, a, a link to uh, his eBay store. Not much of a gamble because he do, does have 100% feedback. And there's an entire website called Accutron214.com which just charts the whole history, all the frequently asked questions about this amazing watch. What is astonishing, it only weighs 39 grams. So very, very light and comfortable. Let's quickly get dimensions out of the way. So it's a 34 millimeter watch, uh, typical of its day. We have a thickness, a little bit tall at 12 and a half. Lug to lug, we're looking at 42, and then lug width of 18 millimeters. So very, very, um, traditional and typical of its day the 60s but for me you know with the smaller wrist it just wears beautifully obviously in fact actually let's get a wrist shot right now so there we go and as you can see on my tiny little wrist it just fits marvelously uh, it's so comfortable so light oh and it's got this awful bits from this cheap nasty uh, leather uh, band but i'm going to replace this as soon as possible dare i put it on a uh, nato strap I don't know, maybe I should. But anyway, um, now there are some drawbacks. Obviously the crystal is not sapphire, so that's going to, um, you know, you're gonna scratch it over time. It does say waterproof on the back. Actually, let's just take it off and I'll show you the back because it does have some very interesting features. Now it says waterproof, but I wouldn't take it anywhere near water whatsoever. <laughs> in fact, legally they can't say waterproof anymore, but that just demonstrates its age. Now, if we see here, sorry, these bits from the uh, that awful band, oh dear. What's really interesting, you'll notice there's no crown on this whatsoever. To set the time, you have to slide your finger under here. So you just turn this little, uh, thing here and you'll see it sets the time very cool indeed and it just flips back in now it runs on a 1.3 volt battery uh, this is not the common silver oxide battery that you'll see in most uh, quartz watches in fact you have to order it from abroad because they don't r sell these batteries in the united states any longer it's a bit of a shame battery life only lasts for 18 months however the uh, the the amount of enjoyment and fun is definitely worth it and quite inexpensive considering it is a part of horological history for me it's it's definitely a, a welcome wild card to my collection something a little bit different such personality those striking mix of colors that almost looks like an abstract painting it makes me think of brach but yet it does make total sense it's just staggering i also am quite chuffed because a bit of a, a, a special watch knowing that richard rogers well actually i should call him sir richard rogers he's lord richard rogers now because in 1991 he got uh, knighted by the queen for his um well all of his amazing achievements he's somebody that i can really relate to he was dyslexic he wasn't very good at school um but yet i grew up in london surrounded by his buildings they were always just the stones throw away and i i was always mesmerized by his architecture and to know i have a, a watch similar to his i think his is a slightly different version and you can get different versions his i believe has yellow hands and the indices are printed on the uh, crystal uh, i might be wrong about that but 
But uh, from what I recall, anyway, it's very difficult to find pictures of close-ups of his watch. But just to know that that such a legendary, important figure, somebody I, I consider a role model and, and I deeply, deeply respect their choice of watch. I mean, it, it's just so cool. I mean, it really is so cool. But not only have we got an architectural connection with uh, Richard Rogers, uh, I live in Astoria, Queens, and just around the corner is the uh, the former HQ of Belova. It's this beautiful Art Deco um, iconic building. I believe their new HQ is in, a, in an equally iconic, even more so iconic uh, Art Deco building, the uh, Empire State Building. But uh, to me, my favorite uh, building in Queens will always be the Belova, their former HQ, typical Art Deco. So elegant personifies everything about this country during that period very kind of mighty and powerful looking and perfectly symmetrical and ordered and straight lines and uh, actually everything that uh, Richard Rogers architecture isn't it's just so cool that finally I got a Bulova that is is kind of linked to me in a way because of I live here in Queens and also because of my admiration for Richard Rogers so I'm going to leave it there I'm definitely going to first thing I do is change that awful strap out to something a little bit more dignified so let's take it back to the studio Okay, welcome back guys. So, a few little things I'd like to add as well to the review. First of all, it's accuracy. Well, it is deadly. In fact, uh, it blows any chronometer automatic movement out of the water, uh, which just goes to show what incredible technology it was for its day and that why it was utilized, uh, you know, for, for uh, Air Force One and for military hardware especially. Uh, because its accuracy is deadly. Another thing I'd like to uh, point out, which is its very unique characteristic, is the sound it makes. It has a very definite hum. In fact, the advertisers, the marketing at Bulova when it was released, they actually kind of capitalized on it. They, they said it doesn't tick, it hums. Now, the only drawback is, is that uh, I, I know I'm a very eccentric, but I do tend to wear watches uh, in bed, um, sometimes two watches, that is, of course, um, and you can hear it, you know, when it's all quiet. Now, I find it very endearing, but at first I was a bit perturbed. I was like, what is that humming? You know, I keep looking around, especially when you move your arm, you're like, what is that? But um, it's very endearing. It's kind of, it's got a charm to it, and I, I, I really quite like it. The other thing is, it's, it's, I mean, we mentioned its accuracy, but also its robustness. It only has 12 moving parts, so the chances of something going wrong are quite slim. Uh, it, had this been sapphire glass, it would be extremely robust. Now, the last point I'd like to address is whether or not it's actually made in America. Now, I did a ton of research. I, I spoke to a few friends that own these pieces. I could not find a definitive answer, so I can't absolutely 100% say it's made in America, but this was the 60s, and this is one of the earlier versions. You can pretty much tell because of the layout and also the, the little lever on the back and certain characteristics. And actually, also, it's got uh, the M, I think M8 or M0 designation on the back, which kind of identifies as it. It. In that time, there wasn't any made in China, there wasn't any offshoring. However, Bulova did have, I believe, factories overseas, um, but the chances are, I think probably 50-50 that it is made in America. But it certainly is a technology that was developed and pioneered here. It took eight years to develop and it was uh, uh, done just down the road. So it is homegrown you know, a, a forgotten icon, and I think for 300 bucks, yeah, sure, it's not, um, you can pick original, entirely original ones up, but they're very scratched. Richard Rogers had his for 44 years, just shows you, uh, you know, how good uh, American made, you know, real American made um, uh, products are, and I think his is definitely American made because he has one of the very first early editions. And in my opinion, the coolest watch you can buy under $500, I spent 300 bucks on this. Uh, there'll be details of the seller in the description. A true icon, very happy to have it in my, uh, 
in my collection and I'm just I'm just loving it I'm loving it so uh, bit of an eccentric Schwarzkopf today but yeah there it is now of course they stopped making them in 1977 you know the court had really replaced and made this technology redundant but in my opinion, it's got a charm, the, that, that smooth sweep. It reminds me of an automatic movement, but yet it isn't. Uh, you can see the, the moving parts a bit like an automatic, but yet, you know, it's, it's deadly accurate. It really is a forgotten about piece of the horology uh, journey, of the adventure, of the passion. And I think it's a great way to add a true icon to your collection. So very chuffed. As a Queen's resident, I'm very, very proud to wear this. So um, anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Please let me know your thoughts, queries, questions, opinions, all the rest of it uh, down in the comments below. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.